everyone out there make fun of Brittany after all she's been through. I'm your number one fan. All you people care about is readers and making money off of her. She's a human! I'm also a man of heart and blood and soul. 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 Heart and blood and soul, soul. Heart and blood and soul, soul. Heart and blood and soul, soul. God, I love you. Hello and welcome to Devotee, the show where we talk to the creators we love about the stuff that they love. I'm Lucas Testro, and with me, as always, is Marion Blythe. Hello, Marion. Hello. Marion, who are we chatting with this episode? Our guest this month is a multi-talented comedian, broadcaster, animator and short filmmaker. If you've ever walked out of a Melbourne International Comedy Festival show wondering where you are, both time period and geographical location, and felt like crouching in the fetal position holding a pillow in the corner of a dark room whilst listening to white noise, it's very likely that you were walking out of one of his shows. His comedy sketches have covered Centrelink sex fantasies and dissatisfied pet store customers, and Hugh Jackman has an AVO ad against him. Damien Lawler, welcome to Devotee. Oh, good to be here. I had no idea why I was invited or, or what you saw me <laughs> as, so it's interesting that I'm here as a... In fact, can I have those notes? You can so take I can that for your next, for next promo. Next comedy <laughs> yeah. no, I, um, well, on that <laughs> yes. note, thank you for joining us. But So how do you describe your style of comedy? Uh, when people say what sort of stuff do you do yeah I guess I say oh I try to be a bit weird a bit absurdist and then I try to change the subject generally (laughs) I'm I'm not comfortable talking about what do what do your parents think of your comedy have they ever come to see your show (laughs) yeah um (laughs) yeah they I guess they're supportive they wouldn't probably share the same dark absurdist sensibilities that I do. Now, last episode we had yeah, Josh Earl yeah. on. Oh, wow. oh, oh, I heard that one. So that's, that's, <laughs> Do you have something you got to get off your chest? I'm already on the offensive. Um, <laughs> well, no, so normally. My, my nemesis, Josh Earl. Is he? It's interesting you're calling me nemesis. Like normally we wouldn't want to put two people from similar fields together. But it's really interesting putting you two together because, of course, amongst other things, you've been collaborators on Lime Champions, the Triple R comedy show. Yep. But whereas like Josh is like the comedian you take home to meet your mother. You're like this gonzo madman who likes doing weird, <laughs> almost deliberately confrontational sketches. Yes, and, so, and our bank accounts would reflect that. <laughs> and our, and our, our, our audiences would reflect that dichotomy as well. But, so how did you guys meet and what appeals to you in, in working with each other? Is it a case of like opposites attracting? Are you the uh, Harry and Sally in the strange comedy? Is this just, no, no, this um, is the one question. No, um, how it's did what we the people meet? Want to hear. I think through... Well, I guess through stand-up comedy, I guess more specifically through Justin Hazelwood, the bedroom philosopher, he was the one that put together the Lime Champions show. So those two were friends um, and Justin threw together a bit of a posse and um, and Justin lasted Lime Champions for about a year. Then it was just me and Josh stuck with each other with a few others that came and went. But, um, but like, so you continued to work with him for a long yeah, time. Yeah, so, well, so yeah. So like you seem to have such opposite styles. What is it about that as a combination that you enjoy with working with each other? Um, well, I guess Josh is, is a nice guy and I guess he's generally too polite to say, no, Damien, I don't want to do that. I feel uncomfortable. <laughs> and you're going to exploit it and drive <laughs> and, him to the and, end. And he'll just go along with, with what I bring. So and, he um, kind of lived this... vicariously through you. You were giving him all the excuse to just be that awful. Yeah, 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 yeah. be my voice. <laughs> yeah. um, and also with Lime Champions, that it was such an intense workload having to – fill up an hour of comedy each week and so we would do how the does show. that even work because that is a ridiculous amount to have to be like getting you know re-inspired and trying to do something yeah well we did the show on monday nights i would give myself tuesday to relax and not do anything by wednesday i would start jotting down ideas Thursday the same, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday would just be full-time where does, writing. Where does the period of self-loathing fit into that week? I feel like that's a key step of the creative oh, process you've skipped. Throughout. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and so and it was pretty time sort of uh, – there's a lot of pressure in putting it all together. 
Um, there was no time to really uh, sort of workshop ideas or go through any sort of drafting process. And because I handwrite everything, so I'd be scribbling everything in, in notebooks, pages and pages and pages each week. Then I'd type it up. I guess as I typed, I would go through a bit of a drafting, pro- just rephrase things, but nothing substantial. And then bring what I had. We'd record all the voices and record everything on the Sunday. And then I'd be generally spend the next 24, 48 hours editing it. Most of the time thinking, oh God, this is terrible. <laughs> I sh- that doesn't, that's not funny. That doesn't work. I shouldn't have done that. Um, this sketch goes for way too long. But it must be such a great kind of development practice to be actually you know so many people write and never do anything with never finish it or never even write but think of themselves as writers or that whereas you know actually having to like get there do it all and put it out to an audience so quickly uh, you, you you must yeah. get over being uh, precious about things very quickly and yeah although <laughs> i mean five years we did the show i never really felt comfortable and confident i didn't promote the show much or tell people about it just because it was like oh don't listen this week we've got to you know and i'll just fixate on one one little bit that i didn't really like or that i thought wasn't that funny and um i'm just a bit like that i sort of concentrate on the negatives you you Um, did um you did get like Lime Champions had a cult following and it's still uh, lots of the audio is available on YouTube now. Yeah, if well, you it's Google interesting because I've just recently put up a whole bunch of the, the sketches on YouTube um, and listening to some of those old sketches for the first time in, in years and some of them I'd completely forgotten about. And so listening to them with a bit of distance and with some fresh ears and I found myself thinking, oh, some of this stuff is actually pretty good. It's really good. That so Centrelink really sex funny. fantasy one yesterday, I was listening to it just pissing myself laughing, thinking we could just do a whole podcast just on that one. The, the <laughs> Centrelink just, sex fantasy. Yeah. We had a, a call of complaint during that one. What happens is that I'll walk into the room and Julie will be sitting behind a bench and she'll take my name and tell me to stand in line. We have some mannequins set up and I'll stand in line behind them and I'll start saying to them, this is fucking bullshit, why don't they have more people on? And she'll just sit behind the desk, checking something on her computer. After 15 minutes, I'll start yelling things like, just fucking hurry up, I've got a hand in me fucking form, this is fucked. And she'll tell me if I don't calm down, I'll be removed from the premises. She'll be with me in a minute. And that really excites me when she says that. And Julie claims to derive just as much pleasure as Warren from this perverse role-playing game. Variety is the secret to a healthy sex life. And we try to mix it up as much as possible. Sometimes Warren will come in and... Even though it's morning, I'll be able to smell alcohol on his breath. Sometimes he'll have sick on his tracksuit pants. Once he stormed off and walked into the glass door, which was so sexy. There was another one in that series, The Forbidden Passions, where uh, a guy, um, he liked the the soft skin of women and his girlfriend agreed to remove all her bones Mm. So she was completely soft and, and malleable. Uh, Justin Hazelwood said that was one of the most disturbing things he'd ever heard. It was, was going to say disturbing, disturbing as that yeah. was the way you just said the soft skin of women. Well, <laughs> <was> somehow much, <laughs> more, yeah. much more creepy than that old clip. Um, <laughs> How did you first get started in comedy? What was your first bit of comedy that you can remember? Uh, my first gig was at the Esplanade Hotel in the Gershwin Room. They used to do... Sunday afternoons there um, and I'd sort of decided that I'd do stand-up a year or two beforehand and just spent a year just immersing myself in, in stand-up, just going out. So how old time. are you at this point? Early 20s, 22. Just at uni or? Yeah. Um, so I took it really seriously um, just getting up for the first time. I always thought that if I got up and died then that would be it. So I spent a year just sort of writing ideas put together five minutes or might have been like four minutes 40 exactly like I took it really seriously I knew that you meant to do five minutes even though most people do generally five-ish 15-ish whatever 
Um, but booked myself into the the Gershwin room on a Sunday afternoon and that was always a great room because it was always quite a full sort of crowd in St Kilda on a Sunday and it would be like 3 or $5 or something to get in. Um, and so there'd be people look, looking at the markets um, in St Kilda and then they'd just come into the Gershwin room sort of later in the afternoon as the sun was setting and you could get a, a full house, you know, 200 people for your first gig, <laughs> <laughs> which is not the case now for a lot of comedy rooms. But um, I I was really nervous. I knew I had it all scripted to the last um and ah and little pause. Uh, I I paid to, to get in from memory. <laughs> uh, I got to the door and she said, oh, that'll be whatever it is. And I just had some money. I went, yeah, all right. <laughs> so I paid to get into my first gig and I got up. I was second on the bill and I did all right. People laughed at the right spots and uh, kept going. Your self-assessment was all right. Yeah, pretty much. I, I was relieved that it was, wasn't was horrible. Yeah. So who, who were your comedy idols at that time? Comedy idols? Oh, I'm not sure because, I mean, certainly growing up, stand-up was never on my radar. Mm. I was into heavily into other comedy, like television comedy and comic books, you know, Garfield and whatever. Um, stand-up, when I got into stand-up, I think probably Stephen Wright was a big one. Um, sort of quirky, deadpan people like that. Emo Phillips. There was a guy in Melbourne who I loved called uh, Crazy E and he would just do sort of absurdist, abstract kind of weird stuff and he really was great. Like he, a lot of his stuff was about his time in, in mental institutions. He had some real issues. but He was literally crazy. Yeah. Wow. Um, but he had some sublime gigs that I would – I, the hardest I've ever laughed at a comedy gig was at a, a Crazy E thing. And if I describe it to you now, it would just sound really lame. But he's just in the middle of this gig. He said um, something like, oh, what are you guys going to do tonight? I don't know about you, but this is what I'm going to do. And then he put on this big pointy hat and some music started up and he just started sort of spinning around. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. And the whole Gershwin room was just like clutching their stomachs. And it was just, I say that to you now, it just sounds kind of lame, but mm. it just, there was some, some chemistry in the air or something. It was just incredible. That is kind of uh, the same as trying to explain your comedy shows to people because you, you can't, they can't really be encapsulated in a neat little description. Um, they have to just be experienced. Yes, that's something I've discovered many times yeah. when I've tried to <laughs> write, the, write, a, write a promotional blurb, um, create a poster for it, um, describe it to people. Yeah. Um, and as much as I, I always try when I sit down to write a comedy festival show or submit a proposal, a number of times I've said, okay, I'll do something a bit more conventional and accessible to people and I'll sit down and next thing I know I'm writing – time travel paradoxes and yeah. decapitated heads. La- and last year's uh, low status update show at the comedy festival was my favourite comedy show of all time. Really? Yeah, I saw it twice and absolutely pissed myself laughing wow. both times. Um, so that one was, it was a look back to the world of today from the dystopian post-apocalyptic world of 2071. Yep. Why 2071? Well, that's just one of those details that, just felt right, and this is actually <laughs> no. Well, it's, it's actually quite an interesting, interesting point. When when like creating stuff that's a bit weird and absurd, um, I've spent like hours and hours and hours just trying to think up the right, the right word, the right object. If I need to come up with an animal, I'll think giraffe. No, giraffe doesn't quite suit this. Um, and like 2071, I just would have probably gone through it. 2050, 2050 just doesn't feel right. 2065, no, nah, something about that's too round. And I, I don't know. I would have just happened on 2071 and some gut instinct, which is how 90% of <laughs> my decisions are made. It's a, it's very like your shows incorporate multimedia. There's usually usually visuals or projections, music, sound effects, yep, yep. you doing God knows what, like acting, interpretive dance. Mm. Um, crazy things. Have I, done, I don't know if I've quite done interpretive dance, but everything <laughs> else, yeah. 
There, well, was, a, there was a lot I of feel jogging, like you, yeah. as I recall, jogging. in the Hugh Jackman <laughs> yeah. diaries. Yeah, it's well, kind the, of like dance. The, I guess I'm a little paranoid about being boring um, just because myself I get very bored and restless watching someone just do straight stand-up standing in jeans and a shirt. Um, that way for an hour. So yeah, I tr- I've always avoided that. Like even my very first comedy gig, I, I think I, I read out a little poem or something. I've always just tried to have a little bit of variety. You do end um, up mostly naked in yeah. Well, <laughs> had that that show. So I was I described it to someone that that show, the Hugh Jackman Diaries show, culminated in me in my. Un- no, wait, in, wait. In, in before, some, in be- some f- before you say this, I'm going to read you the beat review of the Hugh Jackman Diaries, oh, which I, I think I c- encapsulates what you're actually, about to say. I haven't actually read this review. I feel like you're going to love um, this. Right. This is this is a beat review of the Hugh Jackman Diaries <laughs> really? comedy festival show. At around the halfway point of the Hugh Jackman Diaries, Damien Lawler jumps up and down on stage to thumping techno music, dressed in nothing but speedos, with teddy bears attached to his groin and head, yep. and footy socks on his hands, while images of Senator Penny Wong flash on the screen. Well, I'd say uh, even just being reminded that just the phrase images of Penny Wong flashing <laughs> yeah. had me laughing just at that. Yeah. Yeah. Just remember and, and I did feel like I was at an industrial rave though, I remember. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. that was the idea. The and, and the show culminated with me in, not in speed, in, in footy shorts um, covered in fake blood oh, running right. yes. on a treadmill with uh, a duck that had been ripped open, stuck on my head, mm. holding a megaphone which had a recording screaming out, I am Hugh Jackman, I am a duck, while I was screaming over the top of that and with psychedelic spirals projected onto me. Um, and so that halfway point, that was just the beginning of things. Mm. Um, but th- that was kind of the intention of the show because <laughs> um, that show came from a... A, a ske- or a series of sketches on Lime Champions. Yep. And for a long time I'd had people um, tell me, why don't you do – because a lot of people really liked the Hugh Jackman Diaries mm. sketches. Um, and people saying, oh, why don't you do it for the comedy festival? And for years I'd said, well, it wouldn't really work. It sort of works okay as a five-minute little sketch, but, you know, how would I do it visually because I'm not Hugh Jackman and it's kind of repetitive. The whole thing is that he just says, I'm, I did this and then I did this and he's really sort of antisocial and and this this ball of, of selfish, you know, uh, energy. Um but then the more I thought about it, the more I thought, well, I could be a bit more creative and, and inventive with this character, even if it is – I mean, it's barely a character. It's kind of one-dimensional, if that. Mm. He, he's not really a two – you couldn't even say he's a two-dimensional character. So um, I thought, okay, well, I'll make something that is one-dimensional, sort of unrelenting, just – and I, I wanted to have this – I had this idea of the, just having this pounding techno sort of throughout the whole thing becoming more and more intense and more and more kind of just um, or, almost unpleasant. Um, and I, I was really proud of it in, in the end. It went through two incarnations. I did it once at the Fringe Festival a year and a half ago and then six months later at Comedy Festival and I changed about a third of it, maybe a half of it or something – um, and it was almost something that I was really proud of. If I'd, I'd put it through another incarnation, which I just didn't have the strength or energy to do, and uh, neither did I, most of my audiences, I think. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it was my intention for it to be one-dimensional, more of an experience than just a bunch of jokes. Um, and I will say you, Marion Blythe, uh, were one of the, the key influences in that what did I do? You, it was my, after my, uh, the previous show, the low status update, I think I'd sent you a message saying thanks for coming to the show or whatever. Right. And you would write back something about the the madness of the show. Yeah. And and that word really resonated with me, <laughs> madness. I'd, I'd never <laughs> used it. I'd, I'd always describe myself as strange or quirky or dark or bizarre, but... But madness really resonated and that was like the first word that when I wow. started writing this Hugh Jackman <laughs> show, I, w- I wanted it to be psychedelic and, and to have real madness to it. Well, um, you achieved that. And some people really, really loved it. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. Like I feel like your uh, style of humour is people either get it and they absolutely love it or they don't get it and, you know. Well, I think that's true of most of 
the best things in life. Everything that I love is, is like that. That's exactly think, it, really um, polarising. Yeah, and most things that that anyone real, is really passionate about is always uh, imbalanced in one way or another. I mean, most people's favourite films are not necessarily, you know, like, like Citizen Kane, which is a, a brilliant mm. film, the greatest film of all time, but it's, it's nobody's favourite film, is yeah. it? Let's, let's get this ship back on, on path and talk about another idiosyncratic polarising creator, which is the person that you've picked that you're a fan of. Do you want to talk about Something this a little out of left field, I think, for this show. Who have you picked to talk about this episode? Um, none other than uh, Corey Maccabee, filmmaker, musician, graphic novel artist. Want to hear something really weird? Liberty Chew Chewing Tobacco presents Corey Maccabee as Stingray Sam in Stingray Sam. The Corporate Mascot Rehabilitation Program. In this program, prisoners were rented out as corporate mascots. Mascot costumes were designed and manufactured within the prison facility. The exteriors of these costumes were designed to attract and amuse happy conventioneers and their families while reminding them of the corporations they were representing. He, and he was um, the first person that came to mind when I was asked to be on this show and to nominate someone. Um, and I think maybe unlike a lot of people you've had on this show, he's not someone who I've had a lifelong obsession. He's not like a formative influence on me. I only discovered him a few years ago. Um, and he's someone that um, is a, a very current inspiration for me. He, he is kind of um, obscure, but he is also, and I'm so, so glad that you chose him because, spoilers, but I love him. Um, so thanks for that. Maybe mm-hmm. just before we go in, we can give a little more we'll context who to, to who he is. is. So he, he does do a whole range of things, as mm. you were just talking about. But people, if you've been to film festivals, you may have seen a, a few years ago at the Melbourne Film Festival, a few years mm. ago, it was probably 15 years ago, they screened um, his film The American Astronaut. That's yeah. probably the thing he's best known Yeah, for. that would be his most Do you want to take was... a stab at describing what The American Astronaut is in subject uh, it's and It's a look? Uh, uh, a, a Black and white art house film that's a space western musical absurdist comedy. How does that sound? That's great. That's perfect. Um, I think I saw it on a, a list when I f- a list of um, quirky cult films or something. And when I saw it, I, I, f- I was first thought it was the the astronaut's wife. You know, is Charlie's that, the is Charlie? And I thought, is that a, is that a cult <laughs> film? Is it? Re-? And then I realised, oh no, it's a different film. Um, but yeah, when I first saw it, it, it sort of grabbed me almost instantly. So was that the first thing that you saw of yeah. his, the, the film? Yeah, that's interesting because I um, I watched uh, the Stingray Sam um, series so in parts, but ended up watching the entire thing altogether. So it's the Stingray Sam mm. is it was a short a series of shorts, ten minute shorts, and there were six of them yeah. narrated by David Hyde Pierce, yeah. who I love from Frasier, and um, I just was completely taken by that. Love that. Um, when we watched the uh, American Astronaut, I thought it looks amazing. Like the just. Everything in it is perfect. The look of it, oh, yeah. the sound and everything is beautiful. Every moment is pitch perfect. But I kind of felt like it went it, – it, it wasn't like a, the, the, the film – it wasn't the, a film. It shouldn't have been a film. It should have been shorts as well. Like that those things um, – Oh, because you'd seen Stingray Sam. Maybe, yeah. Which was more episodic. Yeah. Um, no, maybe. I don't know. I th- thought it worked quite well. But Stingray Sam also – works as a, a whole piece. The yeah. the six what are they, six ten minute yeah. films are generally packaged as a as a single film. Although mm-hmm. you you do get the, the credits at ten minute intervals. And um, Stingray Sam again is a very similar sci fi Yeah, it's it's, black it's and very white similar musical. He has this very smart, stylish way of doing exterior shots in those films that I really like that they're these combinations of um, you know, models or paintings yeah, or photo collages. That's what I love. It's so inventive. I mean, he had a zero or really yeah, and then low, he can just budget. cut inside to a bar or something yeah. to stage the interiors. And you could just say, on. Oh, I mean, it goes from they're on a an asteroid, the series asteroid, then they're on Jupiter, and then Venus, 
and it's just like Venus is just some field with yeah. trees. And, <laughs> and the and space, the spaceship shots are, are really great too. Yeah. Well, I mean, that was the scene which really took it uh, into like another realm for me. Where I was really enjoying it, and then the scene which really became sublime. I thought, wow, this is amazing. Was where they're they're flying through space in their spaceship, and he just says, "Oh, there's a barn up ahead." Let's pull up into that barn. Yes, yeah. And, and you just see this barn just floating in space. <laughs> and then there's a, a few sort of still images of the spaceship just going into this barn, which they could have just done on Photoshop or whatever. And then the, you see them walking around in this dark barn that's floating in space. Um, it's really dark and dusty and they've got their torches and you can see the, the light of the torches and then they meet this weird kind of sort of... Uh, mutated earthling that's it's like a space hick is mm. this space space hick from um and then the, they pick up this kid called bodysuit because he wears a bodysuit mm. um but but that scene was amazing for me i mean it was it was everything that i love it was dark and strange and uh inventive and and absurd and everything and so you've more recently started um doing like animated shorts it w- yeah. Was was this a direct result of being uh, influenced by? No, um, my animation has come through. I think basically because I've always been drawn to video. I've done. I've worked in video production for a while, um, and I guess video is a, a natural sort of thing for a lot of comedians to look towards, whether it's television or film or you know f- filming stuff. Mm. Um, but the problem with that. Um, is that I don't have a camera and I think one day I just thought, well, I've got a, a cheap Hewlett-Packard <laughs> scanner printer right? <laughs> and so I'll just draw some little figures and experiment with putting something together on Photoshop and then I put them all onto an old version of Final Cut Pro that I use and just experimented with that and um, and just kept going. I thought it might be that you couldn't get any actors to do your material. Well, well, there's that. Too. The, the logistics of, of film production uh, is something that I hate. Definitely. I mean, there's so much energy that just goes into locations and costumes. Yeah, we're, and, we're filming a short yeah, right Yeah, I know. It's, <laughs> is it just the ease of it though? I mean, because it's interesting that, you know, um, there's not just that graphic uh, sensibility which that runs between you and Maccabee's work, but like Maccabee like writes – directs, composes, acts in it and you do everything in your animations. (laughs) Like to what degree is it convenience and what degree is it control? Yeah, well, that's that's very true. It's great just having that total control. Um, That's another thing that I'm a little reluctant with with, with film is that it sort of harks back to It's a little too collaborative. Meticulously planning your your four-minute 40 set that you very first started with, I guess. Yeah, um, and, yeah, like all my stand-up was always written – and rehearse down to the last pause and down to the last minute, um, and I've and Lime Champions was always like that, um, and yeah, it, that suits me. Animation mostly, um, yeah. Uh, film is the collaborative elements of film are something I've kind of struggled with. Um, it's the tension that's there, isn't it? Yeah. Because like also, a film's so hard and expensive and a lot of work to do, and so you worry about what could go wrong if you let things free but equally like so often the best things come from like just mistakes or random things that happen that weren't what you planned yeah. as well well that's that's something that happens a lot with my animation because i have no idea what i'm doing i'm yeah. not i don't know how to draw i have no training in animation i don't have a great visual sense as far as you know like depth and perception and stuff i mean I understand that when things are closer to you, they're bigger than when they're further away, but I'm not – beyond that, I don't really understand. <laughs> you know, I've never been able to draw anything. Um, and so just trying to slowly work my way through, you know, these stupid drawings and cutting and pasting stuff, um, it's just like having sort of a collaborator with me saying, oh, why don't you try it like this? Why don't yeah. you try it like that? Because I'll just do something that I – that just looks kind of weird and stupid that I didn't intend to do. And then I'll realise, hey, that's actually really interesting. I've got, you know, I've done these things with Kylie Minogue, this Kylie Minogue character, 
and I've and just Dr Manning and uh, Kylie and Dr Manning. Mm. So I've done at the moment. There's two online. There's another one on the way. Oh, wow. um, How long do they take to do? Because they look so elaborate. Like um, the amount. Because you got your Photoshop, but then so in there, there it's there's collage built into it, but also sketches. Like as in you doing pencil sketches yeah. that then you're like jump cutting to animate. They take longer than I'm comfortable with at the moment. <laughs> but that's animation. Yeah, yeah animation, I know. Well, yeah, the, the, years, the so. idea for, for, for these ones, for the, the, in fact, for everything I've done, but the Kylie and Dr. Manning ones were, the idea was I'd just have two stupid characters having a couple of stupid conversations and I'd do it in an afternoon. I think I had a free day and I'd just have like a, some 30 second stupid little conversation that's completely crazy um, and that would be it. But then, you know, five days later and I'm still sort of working with these shapes. It just it doesn't quite work that way. Um, yeah, it's so it's, – it's taking longer than – I'm trying to find some way of making it a bit more – bit more in, in tune with my own um, – scattered sort of my, my whims and my my spontaneous kind of moments of inspiration because it's hard to to get that that exhilarating creative rush when you're working on the same two second sequence for a day and a half you know? yeah so but presumably do you write them bef- those ones yeah. before or are you actually yeah, yeah so, so kylie and dr manning are probably the more out there of the stuff that you've done that i've yeah. seen well that was my that was my attempt at doing something as as dumb as possible and so that's the full extent of pretty much yeah also um, another iconic australian to send you a cease and desist letter i imagine yeah you just want to get sure. them all i, I can't <laughs> remember how i ended up with kylie minogue again i think it was just that that first half an hour where i was just going to do this stupid thing for a few hours i probably just grabbed some random picture off the internet and just played around with kylie minogue and now I'm stuck with it, you know, a couple of months later, I'm still stuck playing with Kylie Minogue's head. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting though, watch me bring this back to topic because it's kind of like the way the comedy primarily works in Maccabee's films in that he sort of sets up this contrast of like the largeness of these worlds, like they're these vast outer space adventure like stories. Yeah like contrasted with the smallness of people's obsession. So like American Astronaut is like all about people obsessing about the boy who once saw a woman's <laughs> breast and, and Stingray Sam, they're like they have this elaborate handshake the two main characters yeah, do yeah. that go on for ages. And I guess that's kind of what you like. You have these characters like Kylie and Hugh, th- these big worlds, but then you get them just doing these stupid yeah, it's, mundane it's, things. It's a nice dichotomy, the, the grand spectacle combined with the the minutiae of of everyday life and, and the logistics yeah. of everyday life um, and Maccabee's like sets are really the majority of the sets are really small and they seem kind of um you know closed in and suffocating mm. some of the time <laughs> like his the, yeah. the interior of his spaceship is very tiny and cluttered and the bar in yeah the, the bar um like the, I love in in Stingray Sam one of my favourite details. I don't know why, but he um he goes to fight this guy at the bar, and then he realises it's it's his old friend, and he just says to the barman, "Get this guy an olive." <laughs> it's like having olives at the bar is a, a big thing. Yeah, I this think is that's on part Mars. of the weirdness too of like because there's a very kind of like almost Lynchian yeah. experimental aesthetic that he goes with there because like the he's like. The, the friend, before he realises the friend's just the guy who looks like he could be the troublemaker at the yeah. end of the bar and part of the way he's a troublemaker and then the general ickiness is uh, he's, he's, he's just, just reaching in. <laughs> but he's shoveling like, 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 yeah, like 20 olives at once into his yeah, mouth. Yeah, just like the idea that olives were such <laughs> a key scene in this film. But um, it, it, on it, Mars, it's a bar on Mars. And it creeps me out because I was like, oh, they're all touching each other with their gross olive fingers. It's revolting. <laughs> mm. <laughs> do, you, do you play an instrument? No, not yet. No. We, you're going to have to start because Corey Maccabee's band, the Billy Nair Show. Who are amazing, yeah. They are brilliant. They're really good. I am who I am. Yes, I am. And you know I am. It's true. You sit back while I tell you my name. I am the skin.
And so he he uses uses them as a means to like he because he projects his films and stuff at he, at their gigs. I mean, they're a really good band in their yeah. own right. Um, so maybe maybe you could maybe you could learn an instrument. I think he's um, actually broken up that band now. So he's just yeah. playing on his current oh, thing. He's, he's doing it's bizarre. I think called Small Star Seminar, which is an album. And a crowdsourced feature film documentary road concert movie yeah. that consists of Maccabee traveling the world to venues booked by fans slash backers slash participants, where he sings songs from the album as a representative of the Small Star Corporation, a company that urges people to quote stop reaching for the stars and start looking for the stars within their own minds. <laughs> which right. I can't even start to work out which levels of irony that are happening there. But the songs are pretty good. So are you yeah, I, are you getting him to Australia? Um I should. I, I think he's been out here once or twice. Yeah, he's, um was came he, to Adelaide. Came into Adelaide, yeah. I I don't think – I hope he hasn't been to Melbourne. I, I don't want to look that up and find out that It's he always was, gutting when you discover someone yeah, six months after they <laughs> – I've, I've got a lot yeah. of stories like that. For all I know, he performed at Thornbury – the Thornbury Theatre around the corner <laughs> yeah. from me like <laughs> – on the same night that I was sitting over the road at Tago Mago by myself or something. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> and then a week later is when I discovered the American astronaut. Yeah. I, have, t- I have stories like that. What but, we're talking around here though is that but, yeah. mu- music is a huge element in Maccabee's work. Like he's, he, he has this band or had mm. this band called the Billy Nair Show and his films are all musicals. So my question is more for Marion rather than <laughs> Damien. You famously – Hate musicals, but you yeah. love these. So, what's the difference for you? It's funny because when we were when we were watching the American Astronaut, uh, and they started the first um, musical song in the in the film, and Lucas kind of looked at me out of the side of his eyes, like, "Oh, she's gonna hate this," and I like said, "I love this. This is great <laughs> mm. because it's like it's but not why? because it's it not." Be- it's not corny. It, it's not um, anything that you would expect. What I hate about well, musicals is that you know the next note that's going to happen. You know the next lyric. You can you can pick it. You can finish the song. You don't even have to watch it. Whereas his music is really and the lyrics of the songs like that. Fr- uh, Fred Wood. Yes. At this Fred point, Wood would be song. a good point to uh, to encourage listeners to uh, have a look at the Fred Wood song on yeah, YouTube. That's my favorite it's, as well. And I'm that, sure that's it's a moment up where as we speak. <laughs> yeah. um, it's a song from episode. To a stingray Sam that is talking, charting the names of babies once men were genetically altered to be able to have children with one another. Yeah. Frederick and Edward had a baby named Fredward. Frederick and Edward loved their gentle son. Frederick was the world's only baby man. Edward might not have been the one. Frederick and Edward had a son named Edward. Max and Clark had a son named Mark. Aldo and Rex had a son named Alex. Bob and Ringo had a son named Bingo Zack. It's a song that has a certain amount of repetition in it. Where it's like you're watching the first time you're watching it, it's like 10, 15 seconds, and you go, okay, they've got this joke going. 20, 30 seconds go by, and they go, gee, they're really sort of sticking, sticking with this joke. Two minutes go by and they're still going. It's like this this epic thing and it's, it's amazing. It's, it's amazing. Will. Bill and Kurt had a son named Bert. Bert and Robbie had a son named Bobby Fred. And it's Bob. almost like a, like tribal, you know, like yeah, tribal and, dances are supposed to take you to a different mental state. Well, it, it's like the, um, the, the sideshow Bob with the rakes thing. It yeah. gets to a point where it's... Um, it's kind of a, a bit tedious and then it goes beyond that and becomes interesting again. But yeah. like on multiple levels because, as you say, there's repetition in the lyrics but then they're doing this they're weird moving. dance. Oh, yeah. the yeah. dancing is amazing. Into each other. And, <laughs> and then just didn't. the most hypnotic animation where they, they take two photos of – it's a photo of one guy, yeah. a photo yes. of another guy and then just jabbing the photos together to, for yeah. what their, their son would look like. I mean there's there's never been a, a song like that in a musical, has it? Did that – I've, I've – when I watched that, I thought, has that song just changed, <laughs> changed the potential of musicals? It really, I, mean, it really, just, I think that... Um, who, who thought, let's just keep going for 
Another minute and a half of this <laughs> this craziness. And well, Kristen Schaal yeah. has that. What's that sketch? Kristen Schaal is a horse. Kristen Schaal is a horse. Kristen Schaal is a horse. Kristen. She just keeps going, right. going, going with her being a horse. Okay. But it's they'll very, they'll, yeah. they'll they'll do. But that. that's the same thing. But they've it's done that famously her, yeah. for like forty minutes at a comedy show once yeah. to the point that the audience are walking oh, out. Okay. Yeah. And she's this. almost collapsing of exhaustion because she she's like jumping up and down while she does well, it. Well, her partner just starts because he starts it every time, and then she he does the and and so she's. Christian Charles a horse, Christian mm. Charles. Um, but that's just repeating the same line. Like this is this is is something new. So you're like it is repetitive, but you're getting something new as it goes along yeah. because it's getting more and more um, crazy. The names are getting more and more. Mm. Well, I, I don't even know if that's true because no, it's still just like Max and Clark yeah. had a son named Mark. Yeah, um, right. Bill and Cliff had a son named Biff. Biff. <laughs> 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 Hey, don't I, wreck it. Um, yeah, but, um, <laughs> but it is that weird thing that happens with comedy that something's funny, then it's not funny, and, yeah, and then it becomes funnier because it's still got – it's something yeah. to do with like human obsession. Well, I don't know. I saw a, a, a documentary on, on Russian electronic artists and there's this one Russian sort of avant-garde electronic guy who was having an argument with maybe another musician or, or someone that he was working with and she was saying that it's really boring and he was saying, yeah, but once something becomes boring, after something's boring for a long time, it becomes interesting again. And there's something in that. Yeah. Um, mm. And may, maybe now I'm just thinking out loud. Maybe there was that was some of my um, thinking behind my Hugh Jackman Diaries show. Mm. But that um, idea of repetition, uh, you have a very well known sketch from the Lime Champions, which was <laughs> then what did you do? Which is possibly. The most repetitive thing I've ever heard. Which people strangely seem to love yeah. or at least that they always tell me that they like it, maybe because that's the only thing that sticks in their head. But, yeah, those were sketches where there'd be one voice saying, what did you do? Another voice saying, I did this. And then what did you do? But it was completely this, banal stuff, like I oh, went around the corner to the shops and then what did you do? I oh, bought a Chico roll. Yeah, well, and then what did you do? That. They didn't have Chico rolls so I had to get a Snickers. And <laughs> <laughs> there was more thought into it than that. Oh, right. But, um, Sorry. <laughs> in the fact, can I just go back for a sec, yep. um, back to something I need to say with regards to Maccabee's films is that what really sort of resonates with me and what what is – certainly these days, a very rare thing, is that his films are completely uncompromised in their vision. There's no um, sort of ironic winking at the audience. Hey, audience, isn't this kind of cheap and, and, and tacky? There's no, there's no parody element. There's no actors showing up, doing a cameo, playing themselves, taking the piss out of themselves. There's no meta commentary. It's just a, an idea that's played out sort of true to itself, uncompromised. And and you don't see much of that at all in anything, certainly cult films, cult films like winking at the audience, hey, isn't this isn't this cheesy? Hey, you know, we're doing funny accents, you know. And going and back to where we started with the the way he does those exteriors, it's like a thing where he doesn't he doesn't uh, settle for his limitations being limitations on the film, but instead just reasons to like embrace it and take a film to it to a new level and make it something unlike anything else oh yeah and um yeah throughout he does um like there's a lot of some of the, the musical numbers have like it'll cut to like sort of silhouettes of people singing and dancing and, and words flashing up there'll be these little music videos that that uh that sort of appear but they're very uh, they appear, seem like a very natural part of the film as well not just that, like I, I really admire his dedication and his ability to be so like steadily and idiosyncratically productive despite the fact he's never made a living off these films. Like so many of his work is, is crowdfunded. And like he, he said that he was born poor and stayed poor and he makes his living doing other stuff other than the artistic work. So as I was mentioning before, like he supported himself during The American Astronaut by doing chalk drawings yeah. promoting the film on the sidewalk that people would just like chuck him money for as they walk past. And like it's hard to stay positive and productive like when you're worrying where your next rent payment's going to come from. Yeah, but I guess he's one of those people that just uses that energy and uses those limitations. Um, I guess it's a shame that he hasn't been able to make more films. So you look on like the clips of his on, on YouTube 
and there's always people writing like in the comments saying, you know, why can't people give him more money to make more films? Yeah. There's so much love for him. Yeah. Um, but you also see there's like a series of, of like like Kickstarter videos and stuff for, or, you know, his next project or him in an interview mm. talking about what his next project's going to be and then a year later it's a new project. There's yeah. been a few things along the way that... Well, I heard him interviewed uh, and he mentioned, I guess the interview was a few years old now, but he mentioned how he, he might be getting up a... A werewolf film made in Australia. Yeah. <laughs> I saw that somewhere too. A werewolf, and in some ways, I'm relieved that that didn't happen and that I missed out mm. on actually kind of being aware of yeah. that. But um, you could have yeah, stalked he, him in real life. Yeah, it's it's heartbreaking that he he's out there with these ideas and and just sort of struggling to get things happening. But he always seems to be doing something, and I mean that's why he's an inspiration for me. You know, he's just doing stuff. Um, regardless of his his bank account and and whatever, um, I imagine him being a massive perfectionist, though, because every every shot in his work seems really well thought out. Like yeah, well, apparently, yeah, he's every shadow every, and every yeah, yeah, and like just copious storyboarding and and mm. that kind of thing. So, mm. um, have you did you see? Crazy and Thief. Yes. Is that just his home videos? Hey. It well, looks just like well, it's his videos. two kids, it's, yeah. yeah. And they So just maybe being... let's explain what it is first. Sorry, yeah. So so this is his his third film, which is not so much a, a space western. It's um it's basically his two kids. They were I think Johnny is his name. He was about two years old. And the daughter Willa, she was maybe six or seven years old. And he created this film where they're sort of walking around New York just on this sort of strange fantasy kind of quest. Um, he said that he was trying to just make a, a, a portrait of childhood, um, something that was uh, unlike most, you know, depictions of childhood in film, something that wasn't sentimental or infused with some, mm. uh, you know, message that, that adults can relate to and aren't, aren't kids wise beyond their years. He wanted to really capture the... The sort of the energy and the and the absurdity, the of absurdity children. of of children, and it's there's some amazing moments in that. So he's, I think, about half of that was scripted. He had them sort of following this map around New York, right. um, and then some of it was just improvised, filming the kids talking, um, and some of those scenes of them talking are, are incredible. Certainly, the, the two year old. Um, He's got some crazy ideas. Got some that little guy. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's like he'll just say something <laughs> like, um, uh, "What does he say?" He says, "I'm, I'm my own baby." <laughs> and, and the the older girl, she shuts him down pretty quickly. Yeah, she though. says, "Look, you're not your own yeah. baby." And he just, "Yeah, I'm my own baby." And it's like, what? <laughs> and and that was really great because most depictions of of children are so mm. so sweet, and, and the way they interact isn't. Like the way, the way kids interact naturally isn't really depicted because th- in film, um, the girl in Crazy and Thief, sh- she's generally throughout the film, she's quite a serious presence. She's not sort of laughing and dancing mm-hmm. or whatever. And sh- she interacts with this two year old the way kids do. Like she'll s- say, No, look, that's not right. And, and this kid who's, he'll just say some, weird, like, and he talks about his grandma at one point or, no, he says, um, he says, "How do birds have rooms, or where do the, oh, the, the pigeons? Where do the pigeons? Rooms. Yeah, they have rooms." And um, and she'll just say, "No, look." And you can see her get quite frustrated with him. Like pigeons don't have rooms. But then but, he questions her, and she is saying, "Look, rooms have." And then she has to have a real think about it. Like rooms have walls. Like they're they're yeah. enclosed. Like she has to explain. And they have doors that open and close. Yeah. <laughs> And then it suddenly jumps to something else. I mm. think he starts he starts going meow meow, and he captured that sort of, that strange um, the, the the those leaps of of, of logic that the children live by, um, and then certainly oh, the the kid Johnny because he's just at that very early stage of you know having language and so, and he has the, these subtitles. Um, everything that he says. So when he says something like, I'm my own baby, and there's the subtitles. <laughs> yeah. And subtitles are such a, 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 a formal convention. You know, mm. we see them in, in, in cinema and on the news and it, it's, it's such a great um, – it works really well the way we have these subtitles with this childhood – gibberish. I say gibberish in a, not, not in a negative way. Yeah. Um, 
and that works really well. And, and so it, it gives it more, more, more importance or more, more, more gravitas, the, the, these wor- strange things that he's saying. And just the complete lack of self-awareness. Like children yeah. just don't have that. They don't mm. care. They, they say exactly what they think and then, you know, Yeah, and, and that's what childhood is because yeah. most of them aren't wise and sweet and yeah. sentimental. It's just sort of crazy yeah, and chaotic. Kind of and, there's, jerky. and there's things <laughs> happening and they just run around. And, and, and he, he, he really captured that in, in Crazy and Thief. Mm. As you were talking about that, uh, Crazy and Thief, it was just occurring to me, he's actually uh, quite uh, similar in a way to Shane Carruth as a filmmaker, the guy who, again, writes, directs, composers acts in uh, like he's had a couple of big uh, primer and upstream color that oh, yeah, have succeeded yeah. in like he he sort of funds those himself and has toiled away trying to get other projects up and and not done but but has cut through a little bit more so um and you know they're these people who do these films with quite big ideas but that are just very kind of they feel real <clears throat> emotionally real while just very offbeat in their own thing so if you're a fan of Shane Carruth, it might be worthwhile going and checking out Corey Maccabee for that. We should wrap up. But before we do, one last question. You know, Maccabee's like, in a way, very kind of medium agnostic. Like he started doing animation. He did this animated film, then moved into live action. He does his music, graphic mm. novels, as we've said. Is animation what you want to do more of or are you kind of medium agnostic in that <laughs> same way and you want to move out? Like even his comedy, like what you want to focus on because like his Maccabee's work sort of definitely some of it is comedy but some of it is sort of just experimental art mm. really where where what's where, where are you heading um that's funny you asking that question i think i'm just realizing i haven't thought of that <laughs> at, at, at all um Uh-oh. existential crisis mm, i've uh, well, you don't have to. You um, don't oh, look, i mean there's, there's can... i mean i'm i'm loving doing animation that just being stuck in a room for days and days maybe isn't where I'd like to spend the rest of my life. That there's something about that that you know I'd like to maybe. I mean, I like performing, but there's a lot of about stand up that sort of. I've always had frustrations with stand up and. Are you interested I, I in film? Like clearly, know. there I are mean, things you well, you you're yeah. Blocking I mean, I, I guess I've I've always been interested in in film, and that's that's uh, you know something that I've always got half a mind toward. Um, yeah, I don't know. I like just having some sort of variety. In fact, I, I've really enjoyed with the animation. It's been great just doing something and and finding sort of a weird aesthetic just through naivety and. Is that art brute? Is that what it's called? The art, the art of we'll go with it. Uh, art, <laughs> the, the art of naivety, not knowing what I'm doing, and just sort of creating something and slowly finding my voice. So I've got. I think I'd like to maybe put together an album of some sort, not having any musical knowledge whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. So that could be okay, next, an actual yes. musical album, not a comedy album. Oh yeah, a, a, yeah, an album. So I'll grab some Creative Commons. Guitar riffs and nice. <laughs> scream. It. I'm sure whatever I do will, hopefully, whatever I do will be um, completely uh, unlistenable. I, I guess <laughs> you can only you can only dream, dream, dream. That's yeah. The dream. But um, I, I, yeah, I'm sort of over the past few years just really enjoyed being trying to be as outrageous as possible, and also even becoming more more juvenile. And more sort of adolescent in my sensibilities. Most people tend to become more more mature and serious and mm. and, and complex, but I find that a fairly boring trajectory um, and restrictive as well. Yeah, and it's, I mean, especially with music. You know, how many great, <laughs> <laughs> how many great young bands put out their first album? It's amazing, or the first couple of albums that blow you away, and then you read about. Their upcoming album is their most mature one yet, mm, and it's, it's more more and textured, awful. and they've got expl- letting songs breathe more, mm. you know, more late, and you just go, oh well, that's them gone now. Yeah. It's, it's heartbreaking. You want something that's that's bold and dumb and unhinged and uncompromised, and and that's what I'm trying to channel more more than being kind of nuanced and intelligent and. And witty, 
I just, I just want to be become dumber. <laughs> Perhaps you could write that on the promo for your, yeah. next, for your next show. So we're, we're going to post um, lots of links to our favourite uh, Damien Lawler stuff. Okay. But uh, where can people track down your stuff online? Is it mostly the YouTube? I've got a – there's a Lime Champions YouTube page, which and is just called the- Lime Champions, and my more solo projects that I've recently done are – are also on that, but I've just put together a Vimeo page. Wow. Vimeo. Look at you. <laughs> Look at you. You are going up, Mark, and getting more... Uh... <laughs> um, not getting more views, I'll tell you that. <laughs> no, but, uh, absolutely not. Um, but that's just under my name. Um, and listeners can find us on Facebook and Twitter at DevoT Podcast or email us at devotpodcast at gmail.com. In fact, can I just ask what... Yeah. Have I gone longer than Josh Earl was on? <laughs> was that <laughs> your goal? I want, I want to, I want to, I want more to have had more to say than Josh Earl. I want it to be more interesting than Josh. That's just, just in so, pure quantity, right? Yes, <laughs> you don't care about the quality aspect. <laughs> my nemesis. You know what we're going to do now is edit it down to one minute yeah. below. One I'm a li- second. I'm, I'm, one second say, I'm a little disappointed. I didn't get the. Um, the the giddy fangirl gushing that Vince from Underground Lovers got. Well, do you know what? I feel like we've got our first devotee, devotee. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I listened to them all. <laughs> I, I, did, I did my research on you guys. It was that's more about his obsessive. Um, <laughs> yeah, you, you planned. Yeah, to prepare down to the. <laughs> well, then you would have known from all of your like stalking of us that this is the point where we're trying to wrap up. The, yeah, the that's. <laughs> I'm, I'm just, <laughs> yeah, you've been doing that for ten minutes. Haven't you? So. Uh, so, yeah, come come check out the Facebook page. We'll be posting lots of Corey Maccabee's work there this week um, because a lot of it, I think, needs to be seen to be fully appreciated. Mm. And that's probably true of your work too, Damien. So we'll have uh, lots of your sketches up there as well. So there will be lots to check out there till we meet back here next month when another of our favourite creators will drop by to nominate their favourite thing and we'll do it all over again. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Had to be different. <laughs> Just say goodbye. <laughs>